My name is Josh Breslow, and I'm here to bring you all of your top stories from across the country and the world. You are taking a live look at this hour over the Israel-Lebanon border as we do get to the latest details developing over the last several hours here on the war between Israel and Hamas. Israel now saying that troops by ground, air and sea have struck over 100 terror targets in the Gaza Strip, including operational command centers and military sites. And Iran's president saying the October 7th massacre in southern Israel dubbed Operation Al-Aqsa Flood by the Hamas terror group will bring about the downfall of Israel. He made the comments while speaking at the funerals for the nearly 100 victims killed in bombings by ISIS. Mourners there heard chanting, revenge, revenge, death to America and death to Israel. I want to talk about all of these developments, so let's bring in Mark Chandler, the Director of Government Relations and Professor of Practice in the Department of Intelligence and Security Studies at Coastal Carolina University and also a former senior intelligence defense official. As always, Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to join us to help break down all of the latest here. We appreciate it. You're welcome, Josh, and good morning to you and all your viewers today. Good morning. Well, first off, I do want to talk about the comments that were made there by Iran's president. We've heard, obviously, this kind of rhetoric before, but what do you make of the comments they are made by Iran's president saying that essentially this right here will bring about the downfall of Israel? Well, well, Josh, that's the mantra that Iran has had since the revolution in 1979, and they, they've never really let up on that. And I think what it shows is Iran's willingness to continue to push and keep the Middle East destabilized. I mean, Iran's objective com is the complete eradication of Israel, so we, we need to keep that as the backdrop. But this week, and since we talked on Monday, has been a significant week in activity out there. And I think what Iran is looking at is, one, the killing of the Hamas leader in Beirut on Tuesday, that was a significant blow to the planning operations. He was a key figure between Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas. So that kind of was in your face attack, if you will. And then Iran suffered that, that attack at the tomb of Qasem Soleimani earlier in the week. So Iran kind of took it on the chin a little bit this week and is trying to show sh some strength by continuing its, its standard rhetoric. And on that note here, talking about the situation that happened in Iran, as we mentioned, it was a pair of bombings and nearly 100 people were killed. And this happening at a commemoration, a ceremony that was being held for a man who actually was killed in a U.S. drone strike. But we know that it was ISIS now. They have claimed responsibility for those bombings. Is that surprising? Is that what you would have expected? Well, I think when we first looked and, and we saw the initial reporting, you know, this came a day after Israel took out uh, the Hamas leadership in Beirut. And so everybody quickly ran to the fact that since it was on the fourth anniversary of Soleimani's death or killing, that, that actually it was Israel. But this did not have the initial characteristics of an Israeli strike. Too many civilians were killed in this. It wasn't surgical. And, and the fact that it, the pieces started leading to a, a militant group inside Iran. Now that is ISIS. ISIS, uh, probably not too much, too much awareness for your viewers, uh, has long operated inside Iran. ISIS is a Sunni Muslim group. That's their basis and foundation. Iran is Shia, so you have the religious underpinnings that take place there. ISIS has operated in Iran before. Matter of fact, in 2017, they conducted some attacks similar to this, some bombings in Tehran, and I believe they've been accused of some activity in 2022, some bombings there. So it does have all the hallmarks of an ISIS attack. They came out and they claimed that they put two suicide bombers in there. The reason for Qasem Soleimani, though, uh, you had to realize that he was a pivotal figure for Iran. He ran the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Quds Force, the most elite of the elite that they had. So not only all the terrorist operations and militia operations in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, he was responsible for. Matter of fact, when we killed him, he was in the midst of planning and meeting with Iraqi officials and some Syrian officials to attack U.S. forces literally within two days of us killing him at that time. But he was also pivotal in working uh, with the Syrian regime against ISIS and against the rebels. So he, ISIS had a, a place that they wanted to take him out 
also, but also this is a message from ISIS to Iran. And kind of staying in that same area here, I want to get your take on the situation, the Baghdad airstrike. What do we know about that as of right now? Well, uh, first off, I personally think it's long overdue. The United States finally took some action that was a little bit more direct. Uh, they took out a leader of HAN, which is one of the top militia groups within Iraq. It's obviously Iranian backed. And so this leader, they took him out in a vehicle with one of his deputies uh, driving between meetings is my understanding of how the strike took place. So he, this group, HAN, was responsible actually for over half of the attacks on U.S. forces. And we've had over 120 attacks on U.S. forces in Syria and Iraq since the starting, since the Hamas attacks on October 7th. So when you look at that, being responsible, we had some good intelligence, we tracked him down and we took out a key leader. Now, the, the fallout from this uh, could be significant. Uh, first off, this, this terrorist group, when we designated them a terrorist group in 2019 or 2017, this terrorist group uh, was actually part of attacks on U.S. forces throughout. But they're also part of what's called the PMF, and that's a loose coalition of, military, of militias inside Iraq that nominally work for the Iraqi military. However, they answer more to Iran than they do the Iraqi government. So this group being a part of the PMF, the PMF actually came out with strong words talking about how this was U.S. aggression on sovereign territory inside Iraq. So I think what we're gonna have to see is we're gonna have to get in there and start talking to people. But I do expect either HAN or Khatib Hezbollah to, to come back with attacks on U.S. forces throughout the region. And some other news that we did receive a statement not too long ago, Israel confirming the death of another Israeli man who was believed to have been kidnapped by terrorists on October 7th. He is Tamir Adar, and he's seen right there in that photo, 38 years old, a resident of Kibbutz Naraz, which we know is attacked, a husband and father of two. We've talked about this before, but is it likely that we're going to find out that more of these folks who were believed to be taken hostage are actually deceased as a result of the October 7th attack or just being in captivity? Yeah, Josh, unfortunately, I believe you're right on this one. We are going to find out that more of the hostages are, de are dead or were killed during the October 7th attacks. Now, the, the numbers keep fluctuating. Israel released some new numbers that put the hostage account in the 130s. Uh, I've seen it as high as 136, as low as 129. So you have to look at that. But what's disconcerting here is that they're, they're really saying that there's only about 113 hostages alive and 20 and Hamas is holding 24 bodies. And this comes with how they're still working through all the kibitzes and finding the forensic data and, and really identifying who's left. I mean, it's a, it's a terrible situation that they're still trying to work their way through. So I think we'll see these numbers fluctuate. And unfortunately, I think we're going to discover that more of the hostages are, are dead. And they're just Hamas is just holding the bodies for some sort of ransom or negotiation power. And as I mentioned, a lot of different developments that have been happening here. We also learned Israel officials are saying that Palestinians will run civilian Gaza there, the civilians after the war. What do you make of that? Because there's been kind of a back and forth there. Uh, initially, Israel had said that they were going to control the military operations. However, folks took that to mean that they were going to try to run Gaza after the war. What do you make of all of this? Well, one I, I looked at, at that was, I believe, uh, Defense Minister Gallant's proposal, and I, and I would couch this as some sort of a trial balloon because it hasn't really been discussed in detail in the Israeli cabinet. I think what he was looking at was was trying to put out there the idea that number one, Israel does not want to govern Gaza; they want to turn the West Bank and Gaza completely to Palestinian control. However. They don't want Hamas in there. So you have to have Palestinian control in Gaza, the West Bank, without a Hamas, or we're just going to see a repeat of the situation. So I think what he's putting out there is, one, uh, trying to assure everyone that Israel does not want to be a part of any kind of operation, sustained operation, nor occupation of Gaza. It's just not sustainable in, in for the Israeli military or the Israeli government. 
They want to turn this over to the Palestinians. Now, I don't want to say this is dead on arrival, but the fact that Israel is saying Hamas cannot be part of any ruling coalition after the Gaza operations, Hamas is going to deny this and, and just say it's dead on arrival for them. So this falls on the hills, heels of the Egyptian peace of agreement or peace discussions in Cairo falling apart after Israel took out the Hamas leader in Beirut earlier in the week. What do we expect from Antony Blinken's trip to Israel? We know that he's been there several times since the war did begin about three months ago. What do we expect from this uh, visit specifically? Anything different? Is there a reasoning behind it? Do we know anything that we didn't know, let's say, a week, two weeks ago? Well, I, I think that the if you will, the the stakes are a little bit higher on this visit. So we've had the assassination of the Hamas leadership in Beirut. Uh, we've we've had the Iranian destabilization. We've had Houthi continued operations in the Red Sea. So I think what he's trying to do is to try to re-energize in a very difficult time the peace talks that were taking place in Cairo earlier, even as nascent as they were, they were trying to get something moving forward. So we're, we're close to some serious escalation, depending on how everybody retaliates or takes action from all the events this week. And so when we start to look at this, he's going to talk with the Palestinians. He's got to get them back in an understanding and discussion mode. So he's going to have to visit Egypt. He's going to have to go to Gutter. I think he's going to have to go back to Iraq after what we just did inside Iraq, taking out that militia leader. And then if he's going to do his job correctly, he's going to have to go into Beirut. He's going to have to start to talk there because of what Hezbollah may try to do in retaliation for the killer of killing of the Hamas leader earlier this week. So he's going to get some frequent flyer miles in this time, but he's got to try to bring people back to the table, if you will, and tamp down the potential for escalation. My last question here before I let you go, I've asked a lot of guests this question, but is Israel taking the warning from Hezbollah and their leadership that they will retaliate? Are they taking that seriously? Do they see Hezbollah as a real threat? Well, I, I absolutely think they do. And I think Israel has, has been countering each Hezbollah attack uh, with a similar response, if you will. No escalation in that. Israel has reached out repeatedly over the last three to four weeks trying to reach a diplomatic solution with Hezbollah. Now, the attack on the Hamas leader in Beirut, that is a definite smack in the face to Hezbollah because he was in a an enclave, if you will, that was Hezbollah controlled. And he was a key negotiator, mediator, and, and conduit between Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas. So this guy was very critical to all the operations that are taking place in Hamas and all the and all the work back backdoor work, if you will, between Iran, Hezbollah, and that. So what Israel is trying to do is let's negotiate this. Let's get back to a position where you're not going to attack us, Hezbollah, and we won't attack you. But I think right now it's very tenuous. And we're just going to have to see what the coming days go as to how Hezbollah responds. But Israel's ready to go if they need to attack Hamas. I mean, uh, attack Hezbollah, excuse me. All right, Mark Chandler, a true expert, a friend of the show here. Always great providing expertise and breaking down those developments. Anything else you want to add before I let you go? Well, well Josh, I think we, we need to talk about the Houthis just real quick. Uh, because yesterday we saw a change in their tactics. And, and so again, the Houthis don't have great technology, so we know Iran is behind what the Houthis are doing, at least technologically, planning and the execution aspects of their attacks in the Red Sea. So yesterday, the Fifth Fleet commander came out and said that we are giving our sternest warnings to the Houthis to stop these attacks. But at the same time, the Houthis tried an unmanned explosive laden boat to go out into the shipping lanes of the Red Sea and explode. Fortunately, it was not successful in taking down any ships. But we're, we haven't seen any lessening of attacks by the Houthis in the Bab el Mandeb or in the Red Sea itself. So until there's some sort of strong military action against those sites that are launching the missiles and launching the UAVs, 
I think what we're going to see is Houthis continue this, and now they're putting a new wrinkle in that. And earlier in the week, Iran said that they were going to put a warship in the Red Sea. So I think what you're going to look at here is a lot of potential escalation in the Red Sea unless there is a strong deterrent action taken by the United States, the United Kingdom, or someone against those launch sites in Yemen. All right, Mark, as always, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and help break down all of this. There are these major developments that are happening. I always say it pretty much on a, an hourly basis or so. So thank yeah. you again for taking the time to be here. And uh, you'll be back with me on Sunday. We normally speak with you on Sunday morning. So thank you again. All right, you're welcome, Josh. I look forward to talking to you Sunday and maybe things will slow down just a touch. Hey, we can always hope.